Hi. It's good to see each of you. Hi. A preacher's dilemma on Easter Sunday morning is no longer how to preach the resurrection. That is done. But it is, to paraphrase Shakespeare, to tie or not to tie. That is the question. And when I look around the room, I'm in the majority. <laughs> so I, I love Easter. It is my favorite holiday. I, I long cease to love all of the foo-foo and stuff that surrounds Christmas. I love Christmas for what it means and for what we do. And I love the gift giving and I love a lot of the celebration. But the commercialism has just gotten a bit much for most of us. But Easter is different. And so I've sort of been Korean this weekend. I've holed myself up uh, in study and prayer and thanking the Lord. And at what point uh, would I speak to you this morning? And what would I have to say on resurrection grace? Because grace is the resurrection. The resurrection is grace. And everything comes out of that. And so I want to walk you through the latter uh, verses, actually the first few verses of the last chapter of Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7, and if you would open your Bibles to that passage, we'll get there in just a moment. But this particular day, this particular year has incredible significance for me, for me personally. It was on this day in 2015 that our seventh grandchild was born in San Antonio. Hope Elizabeth, we knew, would not live long. We knew that the trisomy 13 that had been diagnosed while she was in her mother's womb in December uh, would eventually take her life. But she was birthed. We drove from DFW to San Antonio and on to Jordanton where John and Karen lived at that time. And uh, we got to be with family and her little precious life for 32 hours. And she was gone. Death always comes too soon. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how close the relation. It always comes too soon for us. But in the economy of God, that's not all. After the graveside service, my oldest daughter walked up and put her arm around me and she said, Dad, thanks for making some sense of all this. I'd talked about the resurrection of Christ. And so we walked away from that site, just like many of you have walked away from similar sites. And God in His grace has brought us to a different plane and one of looking forward to expectancy and not looking back with grief. But you know, it's those kinds of life experiences that many people turn away from the church. Many people turn away from Christ when something negative like that happens instead of turning to Christ and finding the strength that He alone can give in a very difficult time. They walk away. Other life circumstances happen and people walk away. Great Britain has been such a nation. The Christianity in Great Britain that was once vibrant in the days of Charles Haddon Spurgeon and all of those men of the late 1800s, uh, the continental theological liberalism took over and here not too many uh, years ago you could hardly find anybody in a church even on Easter Sunday morning in Britain. But there seems to be a revival that is taking place. And this week as I was uh, preparing and studying, I was looking at a, a magazine article, uh, a Christian revival is underway in Great Britain. A young man, a writer by the name of Justin Brierley interviewed Tom Holland. I don't know if you're familiar with Tom Holland. I really wasn't. Tom Holland is one of the podcasters in London that has a podcast called The Rest is History. And out of that, they examine historical events and actions. And uh, Tom Holland reared in the Church of England, but left and became an atheist. And now he's 
gradually inching his way back into the church and attending church on a regular basis. And let me share something about that. He's really a secular liberal Westerner who had lost any vestige of his teenage faith. He's not alone in that. That whole continent, that whole nation, and many of our nation are moving that way, and our younger folk are moving that way, not only in high school, but in college and other places as they go. And I think that his journey probably reflects what God is doing in the Western world in today's world. I want to read you some excerpts of that, and then we move to our scripture. Uh, Byerly has uh, documented in a new book that he's written a surprising rebirth of belief in God. Uh, These new atheists, influenced by Richard Dawkins and people like that of the early 2000s, are now finding that their atheism just doesn't work. Humanism is empty. It doesn't work. It's dead. There are no solutions for life's problems. Another significant voice speaking about the value of Christianity is psychologist Jordan Peterson. Now, Peterson at this point thinks that we as Christians and Christianity is useful, but he struggles to believe that it's true. But here is what Byerly said. Christianity is not just a lifeboat for stranded intellectuals. If it isn't literally true, it isn't valuable. Whether Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead matters. C.S. Lewis, one of the great scholars that we as Christians read much of his books, if you haven't, I encourage you to. He said, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought the most of the next. The value of the Christian faith lived out. And here are these conservative-leaning intellectuals who are sort of coming back and they refer to much of what they see in Christianity as cosplay. That's Holland's phrase. It's people who pretend to be Christians without really believing it. And if that is so, then this new movement will fade away. But co-opting Christianity in the cause of secular causes never lasts. His foundation is that Christianity is the foundation, or rather his thesis is Christianity is the foundation on which the ethics of the West lies. But what about Tom Holland himself? In church, out, disbelief, unbelief, atheism, agnosticism, back to worship on Sunday morning, back to examining them. But he had a profound spiritual experience as he dealt with his cancer. He says he experienced a thin place between heaven and earth. As amongst the rubble, he discovered a smashed picture of the Annunciation, and he was in the rubble of a bombed-out area in the Middle East. And he said that smashed picture of the Annunciation, the Virgin Mary being visited by the angel Gabriel... As a historian, he was tempted to put it down to dehydration and nausea. In other words, well, the reason I'm experiencing these things is I'm dehydrated, I'm nauseous, I'm sick. But he couldn't dismiss it. And here's what he said. It was a kind of sweet sense of intoxication. Perhaps everything was weird and strange. And then his conclusion, and the moment you accept that there are angels then suddenly the world just seems richer and more interesting. No wonder the British intellectual G.K. Chesterton wrote that Christianity has died many times and risen again, for it had a God who knew the way out of the grave. That's our God. That's what we celebrate today. We celebrate a God who knows his way out of the grave. Because if there is no resurrection, there is no victory. In Mark chapter 16, the first seven verses of the chapter, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so they could go and anoint him. 
Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? Looking up, they noticed the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he told them. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and you will see him there just as he told you. For the next few moments, I want us to look at that passage under resurrection grace. The first grace of the resurrection is the resurrection of Jesus is a fact of history. No fact, no life. The Bible is truth. The resurrection of Jesus is historically documented. The Jewish historian Josephus recorded the resurrection of Christ and the testimony. The Bible tells us that he was seen of a number of people and over 500 people at one time. The resurrection of Christ was the Pentecostal sermon of Simon Peter. And you'll appreciate that more in just a few moments. The church was established and founded on the literal resurrection of Christ. Not some mythical tale told by an idiot strutting on a stage somewhere, but a fact of history that followers were willing to give their lives in order to preach, in order to teach. There are those facts of history that are very important. The scripture, the disciples, and others, and Peter's sermon. The grace of the resurrection is in the fact that it is a fact. And so we stand today on holy ground. Not only that, but a grace of the resurrection is fear is removed. All fear is removed. I want you to look uh, again at this text. Uh, These ladies, they were scared. Now, it was the end of the Sabbath, as Ole Anthony's anthem takes Matthew's gospel, and he did that majestic piece, the end of the Sabbath, a number of years ago. But in that piece of music, and in the scriptures, We discover the end of the Sabbath was on Saturday evening at dusk. And so as soon as the Sabbath is over, these ladies run and they buy these special spices that they're going to take the next morning to anoint the body of Jesus. They can buy in the city in the dark, but they cannot get to the tomb in the dark. They waited for daylight. And when they came, they were scared. He had been crucified. He was laid in a borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Roman guards were put at the tomb. What were they going to do? The stone was huge. How would they roll it away? All of those questions in their mind and then uh, as if to compound it when they got there, the stone was rolled away already. Who did that? As Morrison wrote in his book, Who Moved the Stone? God moved the stone. They entered and they saw a young man or what appeared to be a young man telling them, he's not here, he's risen. He's gone before you to Galilee just like he said he would. Now go tell his, and tell Peter. Don't, don't forget Peter. Don't forget this one who three times denied him prior to his crucifixion. Make sure Peter knows that he's alive. Out of that, can't you imagine the human emotion of fear? But how many times does Scripture tell us, fear not? Jesus said on one occasion, fear not, little flock, It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. When we read our newspapers, and especially uh, when uh, our president 
uh, affirm this proclamation of Transgender uh, Visibility Day and it on Easter Sunday morning and things like that. That's another sermon for another time. And pulpits all over America are talking about that. And it was a horrible thing, a horrible decision by an amoral individual who occupies the seat of human government. But he shall not have the last word. Our God has the last word, and it may even be recorded in Daniel when the handwriting on the wall said, Mene, 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 Tekel, you farson. You've been weighed in the balance, and your kingdom has been taken away from you. God has the last word on human rulers. But for us, his word is fear not. A God that can raise the dead can do anything else. What's creating fear in your life today? The political situation, the global situation, wars, rumors of wars, family situations, things just absolutely outside of your control, but yet at the same time, they are affecting you. I say to you that the word that God has for us this morning through the resurrection of Christ is there is grace for your fear. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not in life. Fear not in death. There's another grace. And I love this one. There's not much in life I fear. There's some things I dread but not much I fear. That's just how God's wired me. I was in law enforcement at one time. I have been shot at with a real bullet, not just a verbal bullet. So there's not much that puts that kind of fear in me. Some things put some dread, some things like that. But I want to tell you something. Most of us in this room who have reached my age look back and have some failures. Sometimes when you failed yourself. Times when you failed God. Times when you failed your family. And you know one of the things about life is there are no do-overs, but there's grace for failure. The angel said, go tell his disciples and Peter. In chapter 14 of Mark's gospel, uh, in verses uh, 27 and 28, and Jesus is talking, he's predicting uh, Peter's denial, and he says, all of you will fall away. Because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. You know, folks, a Christian may stumble. A Christian may fall. A Christian may stay down for a long time. But you can be redeemed and bought back. Because failure is redeemed by the resurrection of Christ. Whatever it is, it'll not be worse than Peter's three times denial of Jesus. It'll not be worse than the host of people that Jesus forgave as he walked about on this earth meeting people. Now, he never affirmed anybody in their sin, but he reached out to them to offer redemption. They can be bought back. You can be bought back. That was what his death on the cross was all about. That's the picture that we show in baptism. It's twofold. It's a picture of the death and resurrection, not only of Christ, but the death and resurrection of each and every one of us when we came to Christ spiritually in our heart. The cross is death, and we celebrate the cross, and we wear, and we have it on our wall in our baptistry, and it's right that we do that. But listen, there's another side to it. I want a necklace with a stone rolled away from a tomb. There's got to be both sides. If there's not both sides, there's no side. 
Just imagine in baptism. We're buried with Christ in baptism. And here they are under the water. And if you hold them like that long enough, they die. You got to bring them up. Raised to walk in newness of life. That's the resurrection. That's the complete picture of salvation. We rejoice and thank God that Jesus took our sin at the cross and shed his blood and he died for our transgressions, but he was raised for our justification. You have to have both. And without both, it's not Christianity. Without both, it's not life. It's just a partial part of it. And all of the emblems, I'm not criticizing those or anything like that, but not one of us can bring ourselves back to life. Shell and I were surfing some of the gospel truth that's published on YouTube. There's some great preaching. Some of the guys that I know and, and others and, and some others and I uh, found an interview with uh, Ruth Bell Graham, the wife of Billy Graham. Some of you younger ones may not remember, but all of you older ones will. And in the interview, she was being asked how she handled certain things with Mr. Graham being gone so much, with her raising the children and all of the difficulties. You know, it's tough to live your life in the public square. And that's what they had to do all those years. And so every little wart made the newspapers. And she looked at the interviewer and she said, I was walking through the house one day and I was praying and the Lord spoke to me. She said, now I didn't hear an audible voice. I've never heard the audible voice of God. But she said, what I heard, I put into practice. And here's what I heard. And I wrote it down. You take care of the possible and trust me for the impossible. You take care of the possible and trust me for the impossible. And you see, that again is part of the grace of the resurrection. Faith is restored. Oh, Simon Peter's faith was restored. It was a journey. We talked about it in a message a few weeks ago. It's in John 21. You can read it. But here he was chosen and anointed by God to preach the Pentecostal sermon on the day of Pentecost when the church came together. From failure to the leading preacher in the world in 50 days. Jesus had told him, he said, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows, but I prayed for you that your faith fail not. Have you walked into this room today with a weak faith? Life's hit you hard in some area. Or you've watched life hit your friends and your family hard. Or you've watched everything else and you've looked at everything that is possible and found that it is impossible with us. But the things that are impossible with us are possible with God. All things are possible. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, as the song says the resurrected Christ, and let him restore your faith. Because in verse 7, I love it. Go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. Now because the resurrection is fact, and we can believe Jesus on the big one, we can believe him on everything else. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, said he. If you want a path to walk through life, 
walk the Jesus path. If you want to make sure that you're on the right path, understand that he is the truth. And if you want to find joy in the living, he's the life. And he said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. The great psychologist and my friend who's in heaven, Dr. Frank Minerth, wrote a book a number of years ago, Happiness is a Choice. And he begins by choosing all that Jesus said. and getting into the Jesus way. Now, in any church, and especially one like us, on Easter Sunday morning, I need to be a bit pastoral because some of you dear friends have stood at the graveside of a loved one or a family member or a friend in the last six months or so, especially the last year. Let me share with you the hope of the resurrection just from Scripture because you can trust Jesus. You can trust the Word of God and the Apostle Paul who hated Jesus, who was trying to put Christians in prison and even consenting hell the coats of the people who stoned Stephen. On that Damascus road when the light shone and and he fell to his face and he said, Who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And on that Damascus road, the Apostle Paul was converted as a Jewish zealot, angry with Christians, zealous for the law. And he met Jesus in a profound way. Later, when he began to write in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of the great chapters of the Bible, he said in verse 12, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain. One translation says preaching is foolishness. And so is your faith. Moreover, we're found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have hope, In Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. But thanks be to God. Christ has been raised from the dead. For since death came through man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. For God has put everything under his feet. And then later in the chapter, he talks about the body. And how as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. And he talks about the second coming at the last trump. When the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is closed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is closed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, death, is your victory? Where, death, is your sting? 
The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we could pause, and we could shout the praises of God, and we could say amen, and we could be just like one of the little girls that was over here. I watched her doing the music, and she's standing there, and she's about this high. And Miss Stacy's holding on to her, and uh, she pulled her hand away, and she's looking at Josh, and she's looking at everybody, and she starts doing this. Of the innocence of a child who bears the image of God and reflects the joy of Jesus. So how do we leave this room? With more information in our head? No, 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 no. A thousand times no. For Scripture was not given for information. It was given for application. We change our thinking by what we know from Scripture. And out of that, it affects our emotions. It affects our relationships. It affects everything else. And look at what Paul said. And I use this at every gravesite service in verse 58. He said, therefore... My dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Andy stepped out. If I get in trouble, I get in trouble. Erica came a few weeks ago. And you heard the story and you saw the baptism. And how we praise God for you, Erica, and for others. But you know where that started. One of her colleagues at the hospital invited her to church. And she came. And she came. That colleague is working today. But I will tell you, great will be her reward in heaven. Because let me read it again. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's because of the resurrection. That's because our Christ is alive today. And he wants to live in us and through us. And I'm going to ask you to settle that today. I'm not going to intimidate or put anybody on the spot. But I want you to bow your heads with me. While our heads are bowed, and I'll ask you to close your eyes just in prayer. If you've come on this Easter Sunday morning the invitation of a family member, the invitation of someone else, or you just got up and said, I'm going to go to church today. We're so glad you're here. You're welcome anytime. I want you to know that. But if you're here and there's a hole in your heart and you've never trusted Christ, I want to ask you to do that right now. And because there's so many of you visitors, we're not going to highlight you or put you on the spot. But if you'll give your life to Christ, I want to walk you through this. I want to tell you what I'm going to ask you to do, and then I'm going to ask you to do it. But I want you to know up front, it's not bait and switch or lead step at a time. If you'll give your life to Christ today, I'm going to share a little prayer with you that will help you do that in just a moment. And if you're ready to make that public and say, Pastor, I want to come out of hiding and identify myself, and here I am then we're going to sing a verse of what we call an invitation song where we invite you to come to Christ. I'll stand at the front and our uh, staff members will be here to help. And so I'll ask you to leave your seat and come and meet me at the front. And let me pray with you and let's share that. I'm asking you to do it today to get started right. But I'm also going to give you another opportunity. In the back of the pews... On your bulletin, there's a QR code. In the back of the pews, there's information cards. There's certainly in the gift bag we have for you at the back at the Welcome Center, and there are many information cards. 
If you say, I really want to know more about living for Christ and about my faith in Him, and I'd love to talk with you, Pastor. I'd love to have a conversation. You fill out one of those cards, and you leave it at the Welcome Center, and I'll get them, and I'll call you. And if for some reason or other the card gets dropped in the exchange, you take a second step and use that QR code on your bulletin. Don't leave this room today without taking a step toward God. But right now, where you sit, if you give your life to Jesus, and you never have, reach out to Him in belief and say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I believe God raised you from the dead. And I turn away from myself to you. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, help me understand your word. Help me live for you. I want to make this new start today on Easter Sunday. Amen. And there are others of you in the room that perhaps... Uh, you need to become a member of this church. You're a believer, and you, you know the drill. And I'm going to ask you to get up and come, or I'll give you the same. If you'd like to visit, you fill out an information card, and we'll get with you later. But let's stand, and as Josh leads us, let's stand. You come right now. Obey the Lord. Whatever He puts in your heart, you do it right now.